Hi everyone, this is Casey Aldrich, the Manager of Programs here at Community Health Partners for Sustainability. I'm happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, Cognitive Behavior Behavioral Therapy in the Clinical Setting. Uh, it's a sad fact of life that many of the clients seen in our community health centers are suffering from trauma or other mental health disorders. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, can be a useful mental health tool for community health centers to use to help their patients overcome the debilitating aspects of trauma and make positive changes in their lives. Our presenters from the Texas Department of State Health Services will discuss their experience implementing CBT programs and give advice on how to successfully integrate CBT into your practice. Today's webinar is being presented in association with the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. Uh, the Academy supports continuing education and research in cognitive therapy, provides a valuable resource in cognitive therapy for professionals and the public at large, and actively works towards the identification and certification of clinicians skilled in cognitive therapy. More information on them can be found at www.academyofct.org. I want to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available at www.chpfs.org in the coming weeks. All participants will be muted throughout the presentation. If you have questions during the session or during the question and answer period, please type them into the question box and they'll be conveyed to the presenters before we disconnect. When you disconnect at the end of the webinar, a short survey will automatically appear, and we'd ask that you please take a moment to complete that survey evaluating today's activity. For those of you who are new to Community Health Partners for Sustainability, we maintain a cooperative agreement with the Health Resources and Services Administration to provide free technical assistance and training to centers and other safety net providers. More information can be found at our website, www.chpfs.org. Um, today's presenters are Trina Ida, Marisol Acosta, and Kirk Finley from the Texas Department of State Health Services. In their roles at DSHS, they have assisted with the implementation of CBT and trauma-informed CBT programs across the state at a variety of health centers and healthcare institutions. Uh, they've seen how these programs can thrive and how they can fail and have tips for those of you looking to initiate a CBT program or improve your existing program. So once more, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Marisol and Trina and give them the ability to control things. OK, great. So this is actually Trina. Um, I, will, I will be speaking briefly, then I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to Marisol briefly, and then we'll segue back into my portion of the presentation. So thank you all for being with us today. Um, we really wanted to make this as rich of a presentation as possible, and so we thought the best way to do that is really to provide a bit of a backdrop in terms of context of history for how we've gotten to the point of where we are with our implementation with CBT, and then also we thought it important to talk about some of the other evidence-based psychother psychotherapies that we're implementing, in particular trauma-focused CBT, which Marisol will be talking about um, in the later portion of this presentation. So today we're hoping that you'll walk away with, and we'll start with the objectives, um, an understanding of implementing evidence-based practices at the state level and at the local level, also to understand the implications and challenges of implementing CBT, and then also to learn about how Texas has implemented CBT and trauma-focused evidence-based practices here um, at the state. Um, and in part of that presentation, we will also have another one of our colleagues who actually works at the local level and will speak to um, some of the implications and challenges to implementing locally. So next slide, please. And I will turn it over to Marisol to talk about evidence-based practices. Um, to give it, put in context why evidence-based practices to start with, um, I'm going to talk briefly on why evidence-based practices and then basic uh, elements on the implementation of evidence-based practices that have to be present. I know that uh, Trina and Kirk will be talking about those elements as they discuss with you their local um, the state and local implementations um, of evidence-based practices. So um, I think to, to start with, you know, a lot of people understand about uh, best practices and, and research. And, um, but in terms of evidence practice, a, 
definition would be a practice in which, based on research findings and experts or consensus opinion about available evidence, is expected to produce a specific clinical outcome, basically a measurable change in client status. So there are many best practices, and within the world of best practices, there are levels of best practices, and evidence-based practices is the top is at the top level. It's not just a research-based. It's not just um, a consensus of um, research. It's really a combination of um, evidence by meta-analysis and research by experts who have actually reviewed the research and the actual research findings that actually have moved um, the evidence that these practices really work and have actually measurable outcomes in terms of changing the client status and the client's health. And so, therefore, you know, uh, focusing on the implementation of best practices, it's it is the reason why 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 choosing them. Um, the other thing, when it comes to the state of Texas, you know, we're trying to follow um, uh, SAMHSA's um, um, requirements and movements in terms of their um, strategic initiatives in the past two decades have been moving towards the implementation of evidence-based practices. It is a requirement for block grants and many grants uh, through SAMHSA to actually implement best practices. In the end, the uh, goal is to really reach outcome improvements. And for the state of Texas, reaching outcomes improvement was a guiding uh, principle to really uh, choose and improve the practices that we're having improve um, the treatments available through uh, state-funded services to then, uh, instead of using um, a treatment um, as usual, then actually move to evidence-based practices to pull those outcomes uh, up. And in terms of the needs of the state, there's also needs at the local level. In the state of Texas, um, although the Department of State Health Services oversee all uh, mental health services, we uh, contract and, and work in collaboration with local mental health um, authorities. And uh, Kirk Finley is um, a director, is a staff member at one of the um, local mental health authorities, which is called Helen Farabee. And so when we're looking at how to implement evidence-based practices for us, a state organization, we have to problem solve not at a state level but at a local level. And in the end, actually come to the root of why we're doing all this is to really improve um, the care for consumers and clients. So we looked into the needs of uh, those clients and their families in order to then make the decisions on which were with the best practices that we would use. And in the end, uh, as being such a big state, the idea of having practices that are cost effective is, is critical. And when you select evidence-based practices, because they have been tested as actually having um, uh, proven uh, clinical outcomes, then you really reduce a lot of um, cost for the long-term um, uh, implementation and long-term cost of care uh, for state. Now, when you're thinking about uh, implementing evidence-based practices, there has to be uh, basic elements present. Uh, first of all, you have to have an implementation plan, and that implementation plan that must have a timeline for you to help guide what you're doing should have should look into policy and organizational change. So you're going to look at into policy uh, changes, procedure changes, and the organizational changes. For us, the complexity of working with state organization and different local organizations, um, it, it was crucial in, in terms of our um, planning of implementing evidence-based practices. And when you're doing so, you have to look, people sometimes think job, just about the organization level, but when you're problem solving, you have to look at, at the treatment level, how that implementation will look like, and what will be the impact of that of the entire organization. The other thing is at the beginning, you always have to do a readiness assessment that will guide you to understand the needs which includes really looking at the resources, the materials that you will have to have, the presence of them, the resources, the number of providers and the staff of providers that will um, actually implement and deliver the practice that you're trying to implement, and the infrastructure that you have at the, uh, at the beginning of your organization so that you can look ahead and see if you need to actually make changes or improvement in your infrastructure to support the implementations of the practices. 
Uh, the other key element is training. Um, and there has to be a lot of planning, um, training, and, um, and strategic planning in terms of that goes at hand with the types of providers that you have, the type of geographical areas that you have, the size of your state, or the size of your local organization. Uh, that really has a, um, uh, an impact on how you plan for the trainings as you um, roll out your practices. The other thing is having the presence of clinical supervision. Uh, even though, you know, the slide says supervision and competency, those go kind of like hand by hand, you know, even though they are two different things. As supervision, it talks, it's about the ongoing clinical supervision of the staff that implements those practices. On competency, it's about the mastery of implementing and delivering um, that practice. So they do go hand in hand in the sense that some people uh, may think that when you have reached competency, you have mastery, I may not need um, this supervision. But the ongoing supervision is really the one who ensures that there is a pre continuous uh, practice and sustainability through time that is consistent throughout the entire organization, throughout all the providers. So the key of having continuous supervision is it, critical. The other element is fidelity which is not the same necessarily as, as competency and fidelity. Now we're talking about the adherence to the protocol, that you have to have adherence to that evidence-based practice through time, in the beginning, through the transition period when you're training people as they actually have completed mastery and an ongoing for maintenance of your evidence-based practices in the future, you need to have adherence um, to that protocol. So there has to be a quality management plan in which you'll have to have a continuous monitor for that fidelity uh, to ensure that that then uh, that the outcomes really will be sustainable. As people move out of the adherence to the protocol, that's when you see changes in outcomes according to the literature. Therefore, that is a key element in implementing evidence-based practices. The last thing that you have to have when you're thinking about implementing evidence-based practices is really look at the funding and the cost effectiveness of practices. When you're trying to choose which one you are supposed to, you want to implement, you really have to look at the cost of training, the cost of implementation, the cost of supervision, the cost of materials, um, and how will you sustain that practice through time? And, and when you sustain it through time, you're trying to think about the revenue that your organization generates. So the key of looking at billing and how it will be billing impacted by the practices that you have. Sometimes evidence-based practices require certain types of interventions or uh, components that may not use the same language as billing codes and procedure codes, and there has to be an actual plan in how will it look like for our organization if we actually depend on, on, on billing. If, we, if your organization does not depend on billing and has a different type of um, you know, income, uh, then, then that may not be as critical, but usually for state organizations, in our local mental health authorities, that is critical. So we really look into the impact of billing and and um, and having that from the beginning as a piece of, on our um, implementation plan for evidence-based practices. So that is just um, an introduction of, on those elements. I'm going to uh, introduce you to Trina. We'll continue now talking about CBT. And I want you to remember us. Trina and Kirk start talking about their implementation of CBT, you will start hearing about these elements and how they actually uh, um, act through time and the importance of having them present in your implementation plan. Thank you, Marisol. And so as, as I mentioned earlier on, um, I really wanted to talk about CBT um, and provide some historical context for um, where we were um, some years ago and where we are now. Um, and so in really looking at providing CBT or integrating it into the services that we offer here at the state, um, we looked at our data. And our data was reflective of approximately one-third of our population that we serve in our, in our system um, having a diagnosis of MDD. So obviously that had a significant impact on how much emphasis we place um, in terms of value on providing CBT as a service um, within our system. Um, what we realized is that um, despite efforts that we had to improve outcomes for this population um, and ameliorating some of the depressive symptoms, they continue to remain 
suggesting that there was a need for additional interventions. Um, and, and as I said, that brings us to CBT. Okay, and so what Texas did, we, we really looked at our mental health system um, earlier on in, in, in around 2003-2004 um, to really look at how we were providing services um, and how we could better provide services, as Marisol mentioned, in a cost-effective way, in a way that really got outcomes for the people that we're serving. And so born out of those conversations was what we called our resilience and disease management um, system. And the initiative was intended, as we've been saying, to better match services to mental health consumers' needs and to use the limited resources that we have most effectively. So overall, the intention was to provide the right service to the right person um, in, the, in, the, in the right amount to have the best outcomes. Okay. So CBT and RDM, what we found um, or in the, as we were having discussions and as research, as we were researching how to best implement, um, we realized that there were critical elements required to, to transform behavioral health services. One of which is critically important is stakeholder buy-in. Um, obviously, if the persons who are going to be participating in this transformation don't believe in the transformation, then that, that serves as a barrier to actually following through um, and, and, have, and achieving that goal. We also realized that we would need to restructure um, state Medicaid plan. I think that speaks back to what Marisol was mentioning about how we code things and making sure what we're, what we're changing is reflective or congruent with what regulations and standards are for Medicaid. Um, since that's a significant part of the revenue that we generate. We also had to look at new quality management strategies and, and training infrastructure, um, which is critically important. Um, you really you have to make sure you're training your staff um, so that they can then deliver the service in the way that you intend for them to and in, in the way the research says it should be delivered. Um, and so in order to really focus on delivery of CBT, a mood disorder consensus conference was convened, which was sponsored by University of Texas, um, Southwestern Medical Center, and co-sponsored with another panel of experts with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on board. And there was significant presentation on information that focused on elements critical to shaping how we define psychotherapy services and how they're provided in our system. And so the impact of that consensus, consensus panel was that we gained further perspective um, based on the expertise of the panelists, um, as well as leveraging a st stakeholder team to provide input. Um, and that consisted of recipients of services, um, some experts that, that work locally, specifically folks providing the services at the local level, um, family members, and so on, to really have all perspectives of how to best implement or provide the service. And so how we were able to achieve that, um, funding is always a challenge um, here in Texas. And so um, internally, um, we had folks really focus on how are we going to fund such a project. And what they were able to come up with was acquiring funding, funding from the National Institute of Mental Health. It was a grant-funded project. They then proceeded to the design the, the project to focus on um, ameliorating depressive symptoms for the folks that we serve while also looking at um, any implementation barriers and really examining all of those pieces um, and also defining the intent of the project, which is, as I said, to really implement this practice and make sure folks are having access to a service that yields the best outcome. Some of the impairments to implementation and sustaining implementation. Um, what we found in implementing was that, or trying to implement CBT, through our system is that there was significant variability in clinician skill set. Um, there was difficulty in tracking maintained competence, and that the providers themselves anecdotally gave information or feedback on other barriers that they were experiencing um, in trying to deliver the service to their clients, such as disinterest in the homework, which is a key element of CBT, um, also core more comorbid issues such as personality disorder folks cited as um, challenging in terms of um, really getting folks to engage 
in, in the process of CBT. Um, also, we've had difficulty with retaining staff. We have high staff turnover in our system. And so that is a challenge in addition to some of the local experts that we developed out of the implementation of CBT in our system through that grant that I mentioned earlier on. And so these, are, these barriers in and of themselves have been very significant um, and have really attributed to um, this next slide that I'm, that I'm focusing on right now, which is fast forward to our CBD competency here in Texas. And so I hadn't provided as much detail, so I'll give you a little bit more in terms of the implementation and the grant that we sought out to fund the implementation of CBT in our system. There was a heavy emphasis on training folks in general, the, the providers in our system, and training them in CBT. And so over time, that escalated to focusing on developing experts, as I mentioned. So we have local experts to help train people and hopefully keep their skills um, current so that they don't experience that drift. And if they did, they would still have access to a resource that could help address that drift to ensure that they're still providing CBT at the level of fidelity needed to get the outcome. And so coupled with some of the funding barriers and not having continued grant resources to continue and sustain um, CBT in the way that, that we had hoped we, we could over time, we really started to look at all the variables in terms of the barriers we've experienced with expert attrition, people, general attrition that we experience in our system, um, as well as feedback from our stakeholders and the complexity of the requirements we had regarding um, CBT prior. And so, and so just to give you a little bit more information, um, we had um, folks who went through that very rigorous process, those local experts start off with a group of about 20 or so, and that has dwindled over time to approximately about 11 local experts. And we anticipate, although we would love to keep them all, we anticipate that that might still um, be a barrier. And so trying to see into the future, if you will, um, and plan for um, how to continue to meet the need of that one-third population, MDD population that we have in our system, we try to really problem solve what would be the best way to accomplish that goal um, to ensure that people get the type of CBT that yields outcomes, but at the same time addresses some of the other barriers, such as funding and then some of the, the more um, rigorous and stringent requirements we have around folks providing CBT in our system. And so to some degree, we've relaxed um, our requirements, which in the past were folks needing to have completed um, experiential and didactic training um, in order to be a provider, um, which, as I was mentioning, was a barrier for a lot of local mental health authorities. And so we decided to give ownership back to the local authorities and ensuring that they train their people. So folks will have to be trained in CBT, um, but we have decided to work with um, third-party entities in terms of endorsing them to have um, for the local mental authorities to leverage those entities to have case reviewed where they can then demonstrate their competency in CBT. Um, and the standard for competency is to score 40 on the CTRS, which is the Cognitive Therapy Rating Scale. And so we're using that as a measure of competence or as how we're defining competence in our system for folks who are to provide CBT. And as long as they're able to meet that criteria, they can deliver that service in our system. So that was a way for us to really um, try and ensure that the CBT that someone may get in one local authority is going to be the same type of CBT that they're going to get in another local authority in terms of the competence of the provider. And so overall, our goal was just to ensure um, that that was happening. And so we are in the midst of that right now. Um, and there are some barriers in and of itself as far as that process goes that I won't get into too much today because um, we, we have, we're, I think we're a little short on time. But I wanted just to give you context for where we were and why we ended up where we are now as far as implementation of CBT. Um, and so with that, um, I'll continue to just highlight here those variables that I've mentioned before, the attrition that I mentioned, the funding barriers, 
the local authority autonomy in seeking training, um, continuity of services, and as I said and have said repeatedly through this presentation, is continued desire for improved outcomes. And so with that, I will end and I will turn the floor over to Kirk Finley with Helen Farabee Center. He will talk more about the local implications and some of the challenges that um, he has experienced or seen firsthand locally in terms of implementation of cognitive behavioral therapy here in Texas. All right. Thank you very much, um, Trina. And I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Kirk in just a second. Um, and Mary Sol and Trina, I'm going to let you know I'm going to keep your mic open so that we don't uh, run into any issues um, in, in the future with you getting cut off. So you might want to just mute your, your uh, head, handset uh, there in your office. Thank so uh, I'll turn it over to Kirk. And Kirk, you have control. Uh, yes, can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me, Casey? Yeah, yes. we can hear you well. Okay. Um, so um, I just wanted to emphasize uh, that uh, as we started that process uh, back in 2006, uh, the state of Texas DSHS brought in Dr. Monica Bosco, an expert in CDT um, from the uh, University of Medical Center at Baylor in Dallas and then University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, and she was uh, instrumental in developing both the fidelity instrument that we've used, along with um, the uh, along with the training that we did. And she did most of the training herself uh, initially and taught around the state. And so, uh, as uh, as Trina mentioned, and that was kind of handed over to the uh, local experts. But uh, Dr. Bosco was uh, invaluable because she she brought a uh, a teaching process that involved skill building. It was very heavy on, on process of doing CBT as opposed to uh, just a theory uh, of CBT, which was help, very helpful to me. Um, a lot of graduate programs that, that uh, of people, that, of trainees that I've talked to and uh, my, my own is, tends to be heavier in, in terms of identifying theories, theories and philosophies as opposed to actually teaching the process of the, the various interventions of CBT. So um, that was huge. Um, so uh, investment in, in uh, evidence-based practices in CDT has is just uh, been very, very helpful to our state system as a whole. I think uh, it's had long-lasting benefits because we've been able to uh, we have been able to bring that even down to our skills training level. Let me try to I'm trying to bring the slots down here. I can just skip ahead for you, Kirk, if you'd like, if you just let me know. So, uh, you know, in that process, both with, uh, I've done training not only for our own therapist school, but for uh, therapists around the state. And so uh, that has been very helpful in sharing a knowledge base, um, along with the fact that I've been able to bring that to our caseworkers and they can even implement basic concepts of the cognitive model at a skill training level, which is something we do for a Medicaid waiver. Um, so a lot of, you know, in our system, you know, uh, here, just just in this center alone, our office-based uh, clients, we have about 1,200. And so a lot a lot of clients are getting knowledge about the cognitive model and implementing those concepts. And then along with that, uh, amongst the local CDT experts and then training around the state, um, I've learned a lot, learned how different therapists do uh, therapy using metaphors like a one therapist in the Hill Country talked about a CBT being like a, a old timey radio with a logic knob and an emotion knob and that we're wanting to balance those knobs out. Another one in El Paso talked about an iceberg as being the levels of thought. And so uh, there's been a, a, a wide uh, kind of trickle down effect of knowledge base, I believe, uh, amongst uh, not only uh, the clinicians that are licensed clinicians, but also caseworkers and that even sharing of knowledge amongst the trainers and and the clinicians that we're training. So um, can we go to the next slide? Can you still hear me, Casey? Okay. Um, CBT uh, promotes personal power and responsibility, which is an important and needed message for clients. Uh, I think that uh, that's huge in our system because uh, 
and that works in tandem with the recovery focused system of care, which as you know is a is kind of a salutogenic or a solution focused process as opposed to a pathogenic process that we traditionally uh, work from uh, in the mental health system where we work from the disease model. So uh, CBT uh, recovery focuses on how people get better through focusing on their own goals and dreams and their own strengths as opposed to uh, that mindset that says we just have to maintain a reduction of symptoms, the old model. And of course, that's being implemented uh, nationwide with SAMHSA, the veteran system. And, and so CBT really works in tandem with that very well, I think. We have that, we have that next slide. Um, and you know, implementing a strong understanding of CBT provides a solid foundation to add more specialized forms of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, uh, in my mind, it's a foundation for uh, cognitive processing therapy that we do with veterans that we, we also have uh, implemented that evidence-based practice in, in tandem with the Veterans Administration. Uh, as Marisol mentioned, uh, trauma-focused CBT. Uh, overall, CBT understanding is good focus there for the cognitive restructuring aspect. And then when we have it implemented, the result is CBT-based prolonged exposure therapy. And that's the next. Um, now, I'm getting into getting into challenges already. I, I just wanted to add uh, one thing I think before we move to that is, as a local CDP trainer kind of continuing with the four-day training process that Dr. Bosco got started with. Um, in, in addition to that kind of workman-like slideshow that she created where there's intervention after intervention, I, I believe that uh, the key in making CDP training stick is to uh, those live role plays, that interaction, uh, doing this in small groups and doing a highly interactive training, I think, is key. And uh, we do the live role play amongst between the therapist and the clinicians that are training, along with uh, uh, pair role, role playing in pairs, those specific interventions, and even doing CBT just on oneself, learning how to do thought testing and so forth, so forth on oneself is very helpful in making it stick. Of course, along with that, you know, I was privileged to go through the training with Dr. Bosco a second time, and then also get six months of phone supervision. So. Training over the long haul really sticks more so, I think, than uh, just a one-time training, and that you know that does involve a heavy investment. But I think it's been well worth it. Uh, we use Dr. Bosco's slideshow as a core element of the training, and I've added to that a lot of video examples. One of the things we implemented in Texas was we wanted to have people uh, hear a therapist at varying skill levels. So I've got everything from vignettes from Dr. Uh, Bosco's book, Hair DVD. Uh, some of Dr. Christine Podesky's full videos, and then some actual uh, MP3 audio of our own uh, MHMR therapists. Um, and that really helps give a kind of a thorough idea of where to the therapists that are being trained of uh, what, what a best practice looks like and then where, he, where they may struggle. Um, try to be creative in that, and, and I think this process has been good for that. I even use some everybody loves Raymond videos to kind of illustrate uh, Things like thinking mirrors, the use of the episode, the walk to the door, things like that can illustrate uh, CDT in real life and make it more a little more practical and stick a little better as well. Um, so, again, the more the more process, the more uh, practice that 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 uh, clinician gets in training, I think the, the much more likely it's going to be to stick, and also the more ongoing supervision. That's something we've also kept where. I supervise our clinicians and another another local mental health facilities clinician once a month. Uh, so it's an ongoing process, and we're continuing to learn and refine each other as we interact. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so the ba the barriers and challenges um, uh, we've had some local level executives and some el uh, local mental health facilities may be reticent to buy in because concerned that uh, it'll be too great a time and investment, uh, of time and money. Uh, lack of appropriate reimbursement from Medicaid. Uh, as I mentioned, the skills training, there's some elements in our skills training that we do through the Medicaid waiver um, that uh, cognitive restructuring that can be used at that level, but that actually builds at a higher rate than CBT, which is unfortunate because those clinicians have you know, less training and so forth, but they do a great job. We have a lot of master's level clinicians that are pursuing their license as uh, caseworkers here at the center where I work. Um, because of that, though, uh, some centers may have allocated, they may not have 
allocated adequate resources for a full CBT service provision. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, so the many systems, including our own, we have majority of their licenses in CBT certified clinicians providing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive processing therapy less than 15% of the total work time. So other things are taking precedence. We're wearing multiple hats. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Um, if doing intake, doing diagnostic work or administrative duties, those may take precedence. Uh, providing providing CBT to clients who don't have their basic needs met, typically produces poor adherence. Uh, client limited efficacy of treatment, low intellectual functioning can be a barrier, although I've done some work with an IDD individual or people that can't read, just have to be a little more creative. Uh, CBT for those are actively use, using substances or uh, is often unsuccessful because they may be resistant to structure or personal responsibility. Uh, clients with a medication first mindset may go that CBT is too much work or not worth the in, investment. I think that, uh, you know, one thing in the training we recently had, uh, the stages of change model and uh, motivational interviewing was mentioned. I think that's a key because it would probably be very helpful to start to identify what stage of change or readiness for change that uh, each potential client is at to better uh, be more efficacious in terms of who we deliver to because obviously it's an expensive but effective uh, resource. We want to make sure that uh, where we can, we, we are trying to implement that so people that are ready to work that because it is a partnership like any mental health uh, intervention. It only works if it's, it's kind of a, a joint effort, uh, which is kind of, I think, a misconception that, that a lot of people have outside of the health system that we're going to come in and fix somebody. Um, and so that's not the case. We, we have to work as partners, but we do a lot of things in CBT to try to engage those who are giving up or very depressed, but uh, ultimately we do kind of have to have that buy-in. And so bottom line, it's a uh, CBT and it's trauma-focused evidence-based practice splinters are a key to dealing with root issues in one slot, including issues of, uh, as core as basic self-worth, personal power, and responsibility, and, and overcoming childhood trauma. And I'll turn it back over to Marisol. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, again, we're just dealing with uh, a lot of times without a good evidence-based practice, we're often in up just treating the fruits of behavioral health issues rather than dealing with the roots. And again, I think that's ineffectual. Uh, it's not a, a efficacious in terms of return on investment on dollars spent. And it can lead to many clients choosing to adopt a, a passive independent mindset toward their life and recovery. Uh, we're promoting a recovery uh, focused uh, uh, community here, and uh, we want to, you know, and as well as uh, trauma informed. But uh, we uh, we need to we do everything we can to help them move away from that mindset. But CBT definitely promotes that personal power and responsibility, and that's quite a change for a lot of clients. They're not used to that. They're, they're kind of coming in with that mindset of being fixed, and, and we try to dispel that with CBT and with recovery focus. The next, I think that's last one. Okay. Yeah, then the negatives of that, staff splitting, abuse of resources like toxic respite, and a huge percentage of clients not pursuing work, giving back to the community. Those are recovery focused tenants. So those actions and attitudes are the antithesis of promoting a recovery focused system. And so we want to um, we we want to, you know, get the positives out of recovery focus and the more we move people to a responsible and personal power kind of focus that's that the recovery focused uh, mindset and C D T lead to, uh, the more uh, the less resources we're gonna have to expend uh, trying to help them get better. So to summarize, pursuing CBT and other evidence-based practices is difficult, but worth the time. All right. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Kirk. I'm going to uh, turn it back over to uh, Marisol at this time and uh, give you control and let you uh, continue on. Uh, yes. Uh, so I know that you see a jump from the CBT to trauma-informed care, so I'm going to try to fill sort of the a transition to what we're um, saying. Um, you, Trina said in the beginning that we have done a lot of work in terms of um, uh, planning and preparing for the resiliency disease and management service delivery system in 2003. And for us, looking at our system and the way that services are delivered, it's a continuous quality improvement process. So in 2009, we um, 
started doing a review and evaluation on our system. And, um, and that sort of took a few years, actually, all the way to last year, 2012, in which we have um, redefined sort of our, our principles um, and our service delivery system. Right now, we're in a year of transition from the resiliency disease uh, management model to a Texas resiliency and recovery model in which we're trying to be more person-centered, recovery-oriented uh, services. And we still have continuing that process of then finding ways to improve uh, how um, our services are implemented and improve our outcomes. And um, through that uh, understanding of the needs in our system, we came into the need of uh, CBT has been provided for several years by now. And uh, there was a need of understanding uh, the providers uh, were saying, you know, we have a lot of trauma history. And so we look, took, a, uh, took a look at what is the need in terms of that. And if we look at the national statistics, uh, you know, 25% of all children and youth will experience at least uh, one traumatic event. And this is according to the National Child Trauma Distress Network. In addition to that, um, and there, we're having a problem with this slide, so I'm just going to sort of tell you the national statistics. 84% um, of children receiving mental health services have experienced a traumatic event. So we were looking at just providing CBT. We found that we really need to look at evidence-based practices that really um, was designed and proven to be effective to really address trauma in children and adolescents. So um, in addition to that, um, you know, we the ACE study, which is the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, which is the uh, is an ongoing collaborative research between the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and the Kaiser Permanent Health Appraisal Clinic in San Diego. Uh, it's actually one of the largest investigations and long-term studies um, in the nation in which they their findings was that the impact of life adverse effects um, events in childhood has a long-term impact on the lifespan of adults. So what they found is that, uh, you know, this study was actually has been done in adults, and they started tracking and the and the regular population people receiving um, in me, in health management organizations services. They started tracking and investigating what is their uh, history of adverse effects during childhood, and what is the impact that it has had on serious physical illness, on uh, the impact on developing serious mental illness, the impact on relationships, attachment issues, and in the end, the impact on death. And what they found is that for adults who have actually had a lot of um, uh, adverse childhood um, events, then they actually had an increased risk of serious physical illness as adults, including diabetes, heart disease, obesity. In addition to that, they also had uh, serious, more chances of having um, serious mental illness, including depression, presence of hallucinations, and an increased risk of suicide. Um, and in the end, uh, it also led to a, uh, the conclusion that it uh, really led to early death. And that's actually very common when it comes to the population that has a serious mental illness, which in an adult mental health services population, um, it is actually uh, our, the population that is targeted in the state of Texas. Um, we really are limited by legislature on the population that we serve, so we really serve only the most severe uh, mentally ill um, um, clients. And, um, and in particular, and I'm going to say this briefly, you know, we serve adults with depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or schizoaffective disorder, and that's defined by the legislature in Texas. So seeing, we have seen that in our population. So taking a look at the trauma history in our population was impact, it was important because all the adults that we have in our system were once children. So therefore, we have to actually look at um, some, a, a practice that will help uh, address that. So, um, and I'm going to go through this very briefly because our time is sort of um, ending. I want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers. So um, we have recently received a grant from the National Child Trauma Distress Network. And through that, we have created an initiative called Texas Children Recovering from Trauma which aims as a transformation to children mental health services in the trauma-informed care system that fosters resiliency and recovery. 
And um, we have partners, and you see the partners in the slide, with um, Blue Bonnet Trails Community Service and Heart of Texas, which are two other local mental health authorities. In addition to that, we're targeting children exposed to trauma and children of military um, families. And the way that we're doing this, we're doing transformation um, on trauma-informed care, but we're also doing transformation in terms of trauma-informed services. We're improving screening, we're improving assessments, we're improving the type of treatment that is provided. So we're implementing trauma-focused CBT, and we're implementing parent-child interaction therapy. Um, and, um, and I'll be talking briefly about the implementation of TSCVT, which in the context of this webinar. Uh, now, something important for us is that even though this is a, an initiative that focuses on children mental health services, we're impacting adult mental health services because in our system, uh, the local mental health authorities, their facilities actually have multiple services in one location. It's very common. So we have children mental health services, adult mental health services, actually even early childhood um, intervention services that can happen in one facility. So we said if we're doing this transformation in terms of trauma-informed care, then we will do it in a way that we can impact adults, children, and all the population served through the local mental health authorities. Um, so we're looking at improving infrastructure for training, and we're disseminating through this initiative best practices and we're disseminating um, trauma-informed services um, focus that, that focuses on, on children. Um, when it comes to trauma-informed care, we're trying to impact uh, the entire for, uh, workforce, volunteers, administration, and of course the consumers. And we're just trying to create a change in paradigm of what's wrong with you, what happened to you. I'm going to actually skip on the core components because I really want to focus on the few minutes that we have left on the implementation of um, trauma-focused CBT, and so by looking at, through this initiative, implementing trauma-focused CBT, we have really reviewed the policies and procedures again. We have reviewed procedures. We have reviewed the utilization management guidelines. We have reviewed the contracts that we have on local mental health authorities uh, to make sure that everything is in place to really implement trauma-focused CBT. We have really, we've been working on um, creating trainings. We've been trying, we have looked into addressing the issue of those shortages of clinicians of mental health services and how can cre we, we can use the resources that we have in order to actually implement trauma-focused CBT and make sure that we have services available for all the counties that we're uh, impacting. In this initiative, we're impacting uh, 14 counties, but our long-term uh, plan is to create something that we can replicate throughout the state of Texas for the rest of 254 counties that we have. Um, and um, we have been using the, uh, there is an implementation manual of trauma-focused CBT that you can find on the National Child Trauma Distress Network website. If you go to www.nctsn.org, uh, the implementation manual is called How to Implement Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and it really guides you your organization and how to implement, how to deliver it, how to do maintenance through time so that your practice is sustainable as you move forward. And I'm mentioning that so that you have that tool on, on your side. Um, so we have improved screening and assessments. Um, I'm not going to go into the depth of all the tools that we're improving, um, that, that we're implementing for that. I really want to say that we have had to look into addressing special populations such as Spanish speakers, the cultural differences that we have in Texas, military families for us as a new population. So we really have to problem solve how are we going to really train our staff, not only in trauma-focused CBT, but the understanding of the principles of trauma that guides uh, the understanding of the needs of the population that we're serving. Um, in addition to that, TFCBT has actually particular um, uh, specific such as components of individual, family, and parent sessions, and we have to really reevaluate um, and making sure that our billing processes and our procedures match uh, how the practice is. Uh, the state Medicaid plan has some restrictions, and when you meet with parents in session and our target population, our children are not parents, so we really, really have to look into how can we actually implement it and adjust it without changing the practice. And for us, that has been a uh, challenge. Uh, it was a challenge in the beginning. We have found a way of, of doing it. But it was something that we took a, a look at it. And uh, 
the last slide that I'm showing to you, and I'm sorry that I'm rushing through this because uh, we're almost done and we don't, have not had given you time for questions and answers, is that we sort of created a whole flow and a plan that we use to guide how direct care services will look. And we look into each of those pieces of referral, intake, screening, consent to assessment, and consent to treatment. Um, how to, um, who's going to be the person who's going to provide it, do we really have the numbers of staff, do we have to actually change how we're providing services in order to be effective to address the needs of, of our uh, children with history of trauma. So I sort of put this as sort of an example of things that we have had to do in order to implement it correctly and then to have a tool that can guide those record services when you're trying to spread it in out through 14 different counties. Um, I think we jump into contact information. So I think that there's a slight missing. I'm actually going to open it to questions and answers. Um, and I'm sorry that I had to really fly through this, but we had the technical uh, problems in be the beginning. I want to make sure that at least the last couple of minutes we have time for questions and answers from you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marisol. For those of you that do need to um, jump off um, a little bit early, uh, you can always email me um, any questions you might have, and I can make sure that they're directed to our, uh, our presenters and that we get back to you. Um, let me just read a couple that we have that have come through. Um, one is, could you please restate the website where the presentation will be and how long it will be there? Um, that's www.chpfs dot org and um, that will be up within uh, the next week or so um, and again if you have questions there's a, a question box down at the bottom you could put those in um, uh, the website is right there down at the bottom chpfs.org um, another question that we have is um, let's see what evidence-based practices at the top of the best practices hierarchy um, are there several ways to implement the same evidence-based practice? So, so with evidence-based practices at the top of the best practices hierarchies, are there several ways to implement? Okay, um, this is Marisol. I can I can answer a part of that question. I, I'm not sure if I could act, if I should actually answer what is the top uh, evidence-based practice uh, for us in terms of counseling. Cognitive behavioral therapy is our top evidence-based practice. Uh, and then secondary, then we move into trauma focusivity for children. We have uh, CPT, which is cognitive processing therapy on the adult side. Mm -hmm. and, and we have other evidence-based practice that we have implement, that we're implementing. We're implementing motivational interviewing on the children's side. We're implementing integration replacement training. We're implementing nurturing parenting. We're implementing seeking safety in our system. So it there is different. What you have to look at is what are the needs in your organization and that that will guide you. What are the outcomes? What are the needs of your population to really make that a selection of what, what will be the best one? Where to look for their different uh, clearing houses on to guide you how to select evidence-based practices. NREB, which is an actional, um, uh, I forgot now. Uh, it's from, it's on SAMHSA, N-E-R-P-P dot SAMHSA dot uh, GOV is a website that has a lot of evidence-based practice, but there's actually several in the nation. When it comes to a, a way of implementing, is there the same way? You know, you can use, there are different method, methods. You can use le learning collaboratives if you have different sites. You can use breakthrough series, which is actually for a systemic change, or you can just then use the guideline of the, uh, the, the developer of the evidence-based practice of how to implement it. Um, you, you have some plans that you do, which the elements that we talk are similar across the board, but when you look into each one, you have the same elements, but each of those will look differently because each, each practice has its own um, details and its own nuances that you have to problem solve. So, yeah, I think Marisol hit the nail on the head. Um, in, in, in that context, she's right. You have to, I mean, we really looked at what the national research was and what the standards were nationally regarding evidence-based practices and looked at what of those practices were most cost-effective and could be implemented in our system based on the nuances of Texas. And so, obviously, I mean, we've talked about funding throughout. That's a big component to some of the decisions that we made. Um, <clears throat> secondly, we also looked at 
in terms of the resources that available, what would be at a limited to no cost for the folks that we're going to ask to be delivering these services. So SAMHSA is a significant resource for us in terms of um, identifying and selecting evidence-based protocols to integrate into our system because they, they, they have had collaboratives with the experts in terms of um, what evidence-based practices work best for what populations and then devised um, plans in terms of how to implement within organizations and so on and so forth. So that has been a tremendous resource for us in identifying um, uh, protocols to, imp to integrate into our system. Um, as Marisol said, there are, there are a multiplicity of practices that, that we're integrating. Um, you know, CBT is a focal point for me, um, but I also do work around evidence-based supported employment. Um, I also have a colleague who works on um, permanent supportive housing is an evidence-based practice. Um, we also have ACT, a sort of community treatment here in the state of Texas. Um, um, as I'm sure some of you may know, ACT is a national program. Um, and so um, national in that it is, most states have it. Um, and it is, ACT is also, I believe, international um, in some places. And so, um, as she said, just really taking into consideration what your system resources are, what your system barriers are, and then putting that into the context of the practice, um, and then going forth with implementation. And just to say one, two last two things so that we can have at least another question is that, um, you know, we created, we had an oversight um, committee that saw all the changes that we were making. We had several different work groups that looked into actually evidence-based practices, review a lot of the clearinghouses and different um, lists that are out there uh, from that ha uh, actually have compiled evidence-based practices. There's some on, on, uh, the, on the Department of uh, Justice website. There's some on uh, children mental health. There's some on education. There's some on different topics. So really look, and we took a lot of time. That's why you see a length of time from 2009 to 2012 into really uh, trying to improve and reevaluate and, and look into those. So there was a lot of work group uh, to look at evaluating evidence-based practices in general to select the best for us. So um, this is Trina. I'm going to actually have to, to jump off. I have another um, commitment that I have to get to. So I want to thank you guys for um, you know, participating today and hearing um, what Texas has to offer in terms of our implementation. Um, if you, you know, Casey, I don't know if you want to continue with another question. If so, um, do, that's fine. If there are any questions that I specifically need to answer, feel free to forward those to me and I'll respond accordingly. And I'll be here if, um, if people still want to stay for another question. I can still answer questions. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got, uh, we have one more here. And then, Kirk, I've opened up your microphone as well if you want to jump in. Um, yes. But uh, there is one um, asking, uh, what, resources, what, what resources should centers be allocating after staff are trained for CBT service provision? Um, I think they should uh, allocate uh, resources for um, ongoing supervision. We do a monthly supervision here. Uh, spend about, and I can't say this is the perfect model, but we, we spend about two hours a month in, in uh, uh, CBT supervision, and that's in addition to if somebody is pursuing licensure, I'm also a licensed professional counsel supervisor, of course, that's more, that's a weekly model here in Texas, uh, an hour a week, but um, to, uh, again, uh, recently was at effect training, they talked about, you know, long longevity of learning uh, also makes it stick, so just, uh, that also, I think, helps create some fidelity when, when there's an ongoing group of clinicians getting together. Um, and, and so, uh, again, resources, I mean, you have to think about in terms of, of, of if you're going to be able to see clients that are going to be uh, billable, you know, so uh, that is one of the reasons, again, we probably have less of a percentage of, of folks getting CDT. A lot of our clients are indigent, and in our system that means they don't have Medicaid. Those are, you know, those are people that actually we could go for. I know in Harris County, um, uh, uh, which is the Houston area, larger metropolitan area, they specifically go on to uh, no, mainly hiring LCSWs because LCSWs can also build Medicare. And so uh, they, they, that ups their percentage of billable clients. So it depends on your uh, your billable client base, I guess. And uh, But again, I was just, just adding to the uh, what, what evidence-based practices at the top, and I, I couldn't say that either. But I do think CBT's been a good one because 
Again, it's a foundation to some of the trauma-focused splinters of uh, my cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure therapies. And I have been able to, you know, pass that down to our caseworkers in terms of skills training uh, in, in, under the Medicaid uh, waiver and uh, that the, the local mental health centers have with, uh, with the SHS. And then also it is a good complement to recovery focus, which is also a uh, you know, a good evidence-based, I don't know, it's not evidence-based practice, but just kind of a mindset that's kind of across the nation. So um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, I think that, that, that's great. Um, those, uh, those were the last of our questions, and we've, we've run about 15 minutes over, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. But um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Again, apologize for that, those technical uh, difficulties at the beginning. Uh, but this uh, webinar will be saved and loaded to our website at uh, www.chpfs.org. And um, to uh, Kirk and Marty Soul, I want to thank you uh, very much for being with us today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Everyone uh, have a good day then. Thank you.